like Christ, Harry figures out that he has to freely sacrifice his own life mm -hmm. in order to, to destroy evil. And we can talk about... Hello and welcome to The Paul Garcia Show. This is episode 20 and today I'm talking to Father Scott Archer who is one of the most intelligent men I've ever met concerning matters of the faith and as you'll soon see also concerning matters of Harry Potter. This episode was fantastic. We talked about everything from of course Harry Potter to the demonic, the spiritual dimension, near death experiences, occult activity and much much more. It was very interesting and you're going to Love it and learn a lot. But first, before we get on with the show, I want to let you know how you can support this show if you do, in fact, enjoy it. You can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash Paul Garcia. And for $4.99 a month, you can support the show and gain access to very exclusive bonus footage from each and every episode, exclusive episodes each and every month, and much, much more. But hey, say you don't want to spend $4.99 a month and you don't give a darn about exclusive bonus footage. Well, you can absolutely Absolutely, still support the show by using Venmo or PayPal and making a one time donation to The Paul Garcia Show. That's the handle, that's my username, The Paul Garcia Show. Every little bit helps and it goes directly towards buying new microphones and mic stands, stuff like that. Every little bit is so appreciated and thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing that. A lot of you have already done that and it means the world. So, thanks. Before we get on to the show, I want to tell you about one incredible local business that has made this show possible from the very beginning for just 30 seconds, so listen up. If you're a farmer, you likely understand the frustration that comes with dealing with banks that just don't understand the financial aspects of farming, or farming in general. That's why you need to be doing your banking with Iroquois Farmers State Bank. This bank prides itself on its relationships with farmers, and it has been for over 100 years. Their current ag loan lender is Zach Meister, and he understands the financial aspects of farming very well, because he grew up immersed in it in the farming community of Fairbury, Illinois. For all your farming financial needs, from operating lines to farmland loans, you need to call up Iroquois Farmers State Bank at 815-265-4707. Iroquois Farmers State Bank, trusted by farmers for over 100 years. Ready? I am. Sounds good. Father Archer, thank you so much for coming on to the show. You're very welcome. Thanks for asking me. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. It took only about what this is going to be episode 20. You were the first person I asked to come on to the show and it took till now to finally get you on. So, so thanks again. <laughs> You're welcome. So I know who you are. You've actually probably been the single biggest positive influence in my life. I've known you since I was young and I mean, I think you baptized me. So you've been in my life for the entirety of it. But a lot of people watching probably don't know who you are or what you do. So could you tell them, you know, the answer to those questions? What, who are you and what do you do? Um, Father Scott Archer, I am a priest of the Diocese of Peoria and pastor of St. Andrew Parish in Fairbury, Illinois. And before we continue <clears throat> on, I'm going to be addressing you as Father. That's what you do for a Catholic priest. If yes. you're a Catholic, I address you as Father. But yes. why Why do I do that? I'm sure that sounds a little weird to some people because you're not my dad. You're right. Well, because there are different types of um, fatherhood. And one would be physical fatherhood, you know, the father of a family. And there's spiritual fatherhood. And priests give the spiritual life. Uh, through the sacraments, particularly through the sacrament of baptism. And so priests are the spiritual fathers of the faithful because you have your physical life, but then you don't have your spiritual life until you've received the sacrament of baptism, which is given to you by the priest, who is the spiritual father of uh, the faithful. Mm -hmm. And we've been calling priests father for about the entirety of Catholicism and Christianity, is that yes. right? Yes, yes. All right, so today we're going to be talking largely about Harry Potter and the parallels that the stories may have with Christianity. This is actually kind of a hot topic in the Christian world, really, because Harry Potter deals with witchcraft or spells, at least, and, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But before we dive into it, I want to make sure that you're qualified to even be talking about this. <laughs> have you even, are you just someone that's watched a few or all the movies, or have you read the books? I have read uh, all seven books by J.K. Rowling uh, many times. So I'm, uh, 
I, I, I'm not a qualified expert, but is in as much as there are experts <laughs> on on the Harry Potter books, um, I suppose I, I qualify as one. So you know what you're talking about when it comes to Harry Potter. Do you know about yes. how many times you've read the book series I'm, through? Y- yes, I'm into my uh, 13th reading of the series. So I've been through the series at, uh, 12 times. Holy cow. Well, I, I don't know if you already know this, but there's uh, more than one million words. If you read all seven books, that's more than one million words. So you've read over... Now, that I didn't know. Yeah, you've read over 12 million <laughs> words. Yes. Sheesh. Do you yes. wear glasses? Uh, reading glasses when I read, yeah. Because, yeah. And I have to say, I've, I, I've seen the movies at least once through. And it was a young convert in the parish... Um, who is who's also a Harry Potter fan, and she several years ago um, is the one who said you can't really be a Harry Potter fan if you haven't read the books. And so I thought there's a challenge. So I went to Walmart, bought the first book, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. It was on sale. I read it and I was mesmerized by the quality of writing. It's a children's book, but I was I was struck by the quality of J.K. Rowling's writing. So I bought the next one and then the next one and I bought them all in paperback. Um, And I I just was amazed by the quality of her writing and the fact that she could maintain such consistency throughout seven books without contradicting herself in major plot points. You know, that, that I found amazing. It's incredible. And I see J.K. Rowling, and she seemed like she was a young woman when she wrote these books. So Yes. It's, and I don't know if she had kids or anything, but yeah, it's, it's crazy to think that this entire story came out of one human being. Yes. And, and she plotted it all out, you know, written, you know, on written paper. She wrote it on paper, plotted out all the plot points. And um, so she knew kind of what was going to happen later on in the series. And this is when she didn't know, even know if someone would buy her manuscript for the first book. So she had a passion for it, obviously. Yeah. Well, so like I said, Harry Potter in the Christian world can be a controversial topic. Some people mm-hmm. love it. Some people think that it has Christian values. It preaches Christian values and stuff of that nature. Mm-hmm. Whereas some people say it's it's actually very problematic and it promotes witchcraft and wizardry. Mm-hmm. And it's very problematic for kids to read it especially. All right, where do the parallels with Harry Potter and Christianity begin, in your opinion? I, uh, the overall arch, the overall theme of the books is love. There are more specific things that I'm sure we'll talk about that are more Christological, related to Christ himself and parallels with Christ. But overall, the theme is one of sacrificial love in the story. Um, It begins with sacrificial love, Harry's whole story of how he survived as a baby um, and that, that's the overall theme is love. I mean, and that is ob- obviously a, a, a Christian theme. And, and J.K. Rowling herself is a Christian, and she says so. So the whole background of the story in the novels is set to a Christian society at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, where, they, where the students attend. I mean, they have Christmas, they have Easter. Um, So, I mean, obviously, uh, Harry's parents are buried in a church cemetery. Harry was baptized at St. Jerome Church in Godric's Hollow. Um, So it's definitely a Christian backdrop, but the overall theme of love um, is ever-present. That is from book one to book seven, love is the theme. And I think it's funny you mentioned um, Harry being, uh, do you say he was baptized? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, on his parents' tomb, there's a verse from Corinthians. I forget what it is. I think it's the the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Yeah. That's insane. So the Christian undertone of Harry Potter is, is rather evident, I would say. Very much so. Well, so I've also heard, um, J.K. Rowling, in an interview with Daniel Radcliffe, who plays Harry Potter in the movies, um, she said that 
Dumbledore is effectively John the Baptist to Harry Potter, who is, you know, like Jesus Correct. Christ. Yes, I, I, I actually have never heard that because I don't watch a lot of J.K. Rowling. I read her books, obviously, but I'm, I don't pay too much attention to her interviews. Um, but now that you've said that, it makes sense, mm -hmm. which um, goes toward my whole idea of Harry Potter as a Christ figure. You know, because we, we have this overarching theme of love and sacrificial love, which is mirrored in Harry's mother, Lily, who gives her life for him out of love. Um, but Harry is the focus of the books, and it's his journey to realizing what he has to do in order to defeat evil. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the whole point of the story. I want to mention that at the end of the day, this is still dealing with witchcraft and wizardry, mm -hmm. which, correct me if I'm wrong, is very frowned upon in Christianity. You shouldn't be trying to conjure up and develop powers within yourself from means other than God and to do things that, you know, you're not meant to do as a human. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Th correct. Um, which is why that's not the type of wizardry that's ever present in the Harry Potter novels. Wizardry in the world of Harry Potter is something you're born with. It's not conjured. Um, you're not conjuring up powers from the devil or from the elements of the earth. It's not pantheistic powers, you know, d drawing um, from something outside of oneself. It's just, it's a human ability. Some people are born with an ability uh, to sing. And so there's, they might be become a singer. Uh, th some people in this fantasy world, they're born wizards. Hmm. Um, it's a natural ability that they have. And yeah. so it's not something that's conjured. They're not conjuring powers outside of themselves. You could say that their abilities were God-given. They're God-given abilities. They're natural God-given given abilities, correct. And then they go to school because they have a responsibility to hone those skills and use them for good. For for good as opposed to evil, which of course is ever present as well mm -hmm. in the novels as well. That the element of of dark magic. We'll get right back to the show in just one second. But first, this show is sponsored by Fairberry Furniture. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I bet you're sitting down right now. But if you're sitting in anything other than furniture from Fairbury Furniture, then you are missing out, my friend. Fairbury Furniture sells tons of the comfiest, most gorgeous, and most beloved brands of chairs, couches, beds, and tables. Their store is huge, and their selection is supreme. I was just in here last week looking for a new table for this podcast, and the selection was amazing. They've got loads of five-star reviews because they're Central Illinois' premier furniture supplier. Everyone who goes to this place loves it and so will you so when you finally decide you deserve a comfortable and beautiful home head to fairberry furniture in fairberry illinois they've been supporting this show since the very beginning that's fairberry furniture in fairberry illinois well you know again before we go into the stories of harry potter sure. again i want to ask isn't it reasonable for parents to be skeptical about letting their children read books that deal with witchcraft i mean they it's our conversation is advocating or promoting reading Harry Potter, but mm -hmm. that's probably not the case for all books dealing with witchcraft, right? It is, there is potential for problems to arise and uh, curiosity about witchcraft in the real, real world to arise in the minds of children when reading a lot of books about witchcraft and wizardry. But why isn't that the case with, with Harry Potter? And would you agree with my statement in the first place? Shouldn't parents be a little skeptical about books dealing with this type of thing? I would say parents should not let their children read books just about witchcraft. Um, so I'm, I can't really speak about other books on witchcraft because most books on witchcraft are all about conjuring and about more evil, sinister elements that we cannot accept as Christians. Whereas Harry Potter, I don't see in that light at all. 
Right. It's just like you said, they're differently abled individuals with different God given abilities. It, that's what yes. I'm getting from it. Correct. Yeah. Whereas it's it's wrong in principle to participate in witchcraft in the modern world <clears throat> because you're trying to gain access to knowledge powers that are not meant for you by way of of mediums such as mm-hmm. such as actual mediums, soothsayers, uh, mm-hmm. fortune tellers spells things like that and and not god so mm-hmm. i could see that being why correct witchcraft is wrong and why harry potter's okay in, in the world of harry potter you cannot become a witch you cannot become a wizard and the, and wizard you know wizard is kind of the collective term for witches and wizards you cannot be just become one you can't learn how to be one you, you that you can't conjure it up um you're e- you're either given that gift when you're born or you're not. You said that Harry Potter is much like a Jesus figure in these stories. How, how do you figure? A Christ figure in literature is a character that exhibits Christ-like qualities. In Harry Potter, he has been born with a task. He is what they call the chosen one. What has he chosen to do? He's he has chosen to destroy evil once and for all. And that's why Christ came into the world to destroy evil. And like Christ, Harry figures out that he has to freely sacrifice his own life mm-hmm. in order to to destroy evil. And we can talk about specifics as oh, yeah, you wish. For sure. But you said something. You said Harry figures out that yeah. this is his, his, what he's supposed to do and mm-hmm. his calling, and yes. his destiny. Mm-hmm. Did, did, did Jesus, this is my own curiosity, and I'm sure a lot of people will be interested. Did Jesus figure out that it was his destiny or did he always know? Was it at the baptism uh, with John the Baptist, whom this church was used to be named after, by the way? Like, is that when he figured out that he was no, all these things? No, he knew from, yeah, no, Christ always knew what his destiny was, what he was on earth for. Even as a baby? Even as a baby at conception, because he's God. He's the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Mm -hmm. So he, yeah, he he knew always that uh, that was his. I guess he does tell Mary at the wedding at Cana that it's not yet my time. Mm -hmm. And he says that kind of a few times throughout the Bible. So I guess that answers my question pretty well. So... Unlike Harry, Harry figured it out at a, Correct, at a later Harry age. Harry isn't Christ. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's not the second person of the Blessed Trinity incarnate. <laughs> he He's a human. He's a Christ uh, figure in a, a story. He's a Christ figure in a story. Right. Okay, so uh, you said that you could go into, you know, more about him being the Christ figure. Could you Could you elaborate on that a little more? It's revealed to Harry with the help of Dumbledore throughout the 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 book series, that he's the one who has to defeat the the malevolent uh, antagonist, Voldemort. He's the Dark Lord, Voldemort, and he's the one that has to be destroyed in order to destroy evil. In the divine world, what is Voldemort um, like? I, I think you could argue Voldemort could be a symbol of Satan, the devil, um, because there, he has Voldemort is the care. He has no love. There is no love in his life whatsoever. And he's he's devoid of love. He's incredibly uh, evil and incredibly powerful and power hungry too. And power hungry. And a lot of his motivation is not only to have power, but also to live forever, to be immortal. Um, and so through the, the series, he sets up a series of uh, horcruxes. He makes these horcruxes. He encases pieces of his soul in um, these objects in order to live forever. Whereas we as Christians, we see immortality in terms of our soul living forever in the afterlife. That's why J.K. Rowling put on the tomb of Harry's parents, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. This is when Harry uh, 
in book seven goes and visits Godric's Hollow, where he was born and where his parents were killed by Voldemort. Um, and that means Christ, by his sacrificial death on the cross, destroyed eternal death, whereas Voldemort wants to remain physically alive forever. Um, that's not the type of life we're searching for. We're searching no. for eternal life in the afterlife. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And Harry figures out in the course of the story um, that he has to sacrifice his own life in order to save the ones he loves, the world he loves, and consequently the whole world so that Voldemort doesn't take over and conquer the whole world. So he figures out he can't fight Voldemort. He has to give, he has to sacrifice his life in order for Voldemort to be destroyed. And that's just like Jesus Christ dying for our sins on the cross, giving his own life. Correct. Suffering prior to that and eventual right, death correct. as well. And so Harry eventually in the book Deathly Hollows, he meets up with the, the, during the Battle of Hogwarts, he meets up with Voldemort in the Forbidden Forest where he's waiting there with his Death Eaters. Those are his evil followers. He has what his father gave him, an invisibility cloak um, that he uses throughout the books. He dashes away his wand in his robes, takes off his cloak. He presents himself there to Voldemort and Voldemort casts the killing curse, the Avadra Kedavra curse, and Harry falls to the ground, apparently dead. And he goes to this other place. It's kind of misty and mystical. And there he speaks with um, his mentor, Albus Dumbledore, um, who's died in the sixth book, at the end of the sixth book. That Misty, when, when Harry has a near-death experience in the woods with Voldemort, and he goes to this Misty land and speaks to Albus Dumbledore, mm -hmm. who has since died at this point. Correct. That reminds me a lot of when Jesus, you know, in the Apostles' Creed, it says he descended into hell, mm -hmm. whereas... Correct me if I'm wrong. He doesn't. It's really not correct to say he went to hell. Hell is eternal damnation and a separation mm -hmm. from God. Mm -hmm. I've heard that the translation it, it fits better that he went to Abraham's bosom or the something. The bosom like of that. Abraham. Right. right. He didn't go to the hell of the damned. He went to the to the uh, limbo of the fathers. When we limbo say he descended fathers. into hell, he went to the limbo of the fathers, where you know Adam, Eve. Abraham, all Sarah, the good people. all the righteous people who died before the time of Christ. Mm -hmm. He went there to announce that they would soon be free and that they would soon be going to heaven. In the case of Harry Potter, what happened to him, when, when, he, when he's a baby, Voldemort tries to kill him because of a prophecy. There's a prophecy Again, drawing parallels with Old How Testament prophecies. And it is the prophecy that's overheard by one of the now professors at Hogwarts, uh, Severus Snape. But he was, Severus Snape was a Death Eater. And he overhears this prophecy from uh, Sybil Tra Trelawney. And the prophecy is the one who has the power to defeat the Dark Lord approaches, and he will be born at the end of July to parents who have three times um, defied the Dark Lord. And of course, he interprets that to be Harry Potter. He goes to their cottage because the secret keeper that was supposed to keep the location of Harry and his parents' secret betrayed them and gave the information to Voldemort. He goes to the cottage. He kills Harry's dad, named James, kills his mother. But before he kills the mother, he tells her, get away, go away, because he's going to kill Harry. He's not intending to kill Lily, Harry's, Harry's mother. And she says, no, kill me instead. And she sacrifices her love again this sacrificial love that's throughout the books she puts herself between harry and voldemort and so he decides all right i'm gonna kill you if that's what it takes so she sacrifices herself out of love for her son but this casts a protection of love over harry so the first time ever 
The killing curse does not kill the intended victim, Harry, who's uh, just over one years old at that time. And that's because of the sacrificial love that's kind of protected him, given Correct. by his mother dying for him? Correct. That's because incredible. his mother died for him, he's protected from the, the Avadra Kedavra curse, the killing curse. And so it just leaves a scar on his head. Jeez, it makes me think of, you know, there's a special kid. He's much like, he, you could liken him to the Messiah, that is Jesus Christ. And the news of the Messiah being born is kind of spread throughout the the Middle East, you know, where mm-hmm. Jesus is is born. And King Herod doesn't like the sound of that. And so it, that's a lot like Voldemort, very, not liking the sound of very that. very much like Voldemort and Harry. He hears of the birth of the, the, the one who has the power to vanquish him is approaching and he's going to be born at the end of july voldemort finds out about it from severus snape and so what does voldemort do like king herod he said he thinks if i just if i destroy this child i will be all powerful and immortal and there will be no one to threaten me we'll get right back to the show in just one second but first this show is sponsored by psf legacy jujitsu in normal Do you want to be a wimp for the rest of your life, or do you want to be tough, in shape, confident, and able to defend yourself? If you chose the latter, which I hope you did, then you should really consider signing up for jiu-jitsu classes at PSF Legacy Jiu-Jitsu in Normal. I personally love this place. The instructor is Jared Game, and he was on episode 6 of this very podcast, and he's incredible, both as a technician and as a man. The team here is amazing, and they are so welcoming to absolutely anybody. For elite-level fitness training and elite-level self-defense, and combative techniques you need to check out PSF Legacy Jiu-Jitsu in Normal, Illinois. The prices are incredibly low and the education is incredibly high quality. Check them out because this place is awesome. Well, I I love talking about the technical parts of what love is and I love talking about love in general. Love, my best definition of it is willing the good of another even at a sacrifice to yourself Mm -hmm. that kind of love seems to be the universal love you know parents will sacrifice for their children even if it doesn't help the parents at all it's for the good of the children the same if you love your husband or wife you will sacrifice for them for their Mm well-being even if it's at a sacrifice to you has nothing to do with romance has nothing to do with this and that although that is a part of love the main component of love or the main aspect of love is that it is a sacrifice for the well-being of another Mm -hmm. and i mean that that seems to be the case in jesus and what he does i mean that's the greatest display of love it's kind of the same with harry i Mm -hmm. mean he for the well-being of everyone in the world he's willing to die and right. he does so willingly and courageously yeah because true love demands sacrifice it demands some type of a sacrifice um it's it's not like romantic love it's 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 a true sacrificial love um real quick he, mother Teresa, i love a famous quote from her is that love in order to be true must sacrifice so that just goes along with exactly your the theme of love and sacrificial love. When Harry is in this, I don't know if we want to call it a purgatorial state, this limbo state where he meets up with Dumbledore in the last book. This misty. It turns out it, it kind of as you're reading along, it, the the place where they are becomes what Harry starts imagining it to be. So Harry finds himself laying on the cold ground and kind of this white mist around him and he's naked and he thinks i i should have some robes um and robes appear and he meets up with dumbledore and they start talking and um dumbledore wants to know actually harry wants to know where they are and dumbledore said i'm i was going to ask you that and he said well i i think we're in king's cross station in London. Um, and so it kind of becomes King's Cross Station. And what they meet up with and what they hear groaning or is, is this deformed little creature that's under one of the benches. And that is v- what's left of Voldemort's soul and nothing can be done. Dumbledore says to him at that point, do not pity the dead, Harry, pity the living. And most of all, those who live without love kind of drawing to a conclusion that the idea of the the, of love being the most powerful thing in the world 
and at that point then Harry knows he has to go back because he at one point he says I wouldn't have to go back would I and he said well no I don't think I think if you wanted to move on you could um so I think it's up to you Harry and he says I'm I I'm going back and so he goes back and he finds himself then laying on the ground in the forbidden forest but he realizes he's not dead you know he's able to face Voldemort then mm-hmm. Near-death experiences as a whole are very interesting to me, and I don't believe there's any catechismal teaching in the Catholic Church about the nature of those near-death experiences. They could very well be, you know, administered by God to happen, and they might, you know, you might have an option to die or come back for whatever reason. I don't know. Do you have any opinions on near-death experiences at all? I know we're just talking about Harry Potter, but in in real life. I, I don't. I, I think that the mind is going through something, but I don't believe in near-death experiences. Where you actually I think meet you up either, with God and stuff. Cr- I don't. I think you when you die, you either go to heaven, hell, or purgatory. Um, and yeah, I think I, I just that's just my personal opinion is that um, something is happening with the mind, or that the mind is going through something as you're in a dying experience. Yeah, a chemical reaction or a dumping of that's DMT just, maybe. Right, and stuff that's like that. just my personal opinion. Sure, yeah. And it could be, you know, in the design, those chemical reactions and DMT and other things in the brain releasing, uh, that could be in the design that God put. Like maybe he designed it to be that way so that those experiences would come forth when you are having a near-death experience and that you would come back likely... Um, a more a person that's more willing to believe in God. I don't know. That's just a theory. But okay, so we've talked a lot about Harry Potter and the parallels between the stories written by J.K. Rowling and the biblical stories in in Christ and God and Christianity as a whole. What would you say to people who won't let their kids read Harry Potter, or maybe to other Catholic priests that are much more hesitant? to condone reading Harry Potter or maybe flat out against it? What would you say to them? <laughs> I've had a lot of people say and I've, that Harry Potter's evil. Um, and most of the people who say that haven't read the books. Most of the people who think that, that is evil are going off what other people are saying. Right, yeah, that's absolutely the case. I have heard people say that in the books there are real spells and i told this to my very dear friend who's also our diocesan exorcist wow that, interesting that, um, <laughs> you know you know that people were that someone had said there are real spells in harry potter and he laughed and uh he said real spells real spells spells aren't real you know it's like there's no such thing as a real spell you know, something uh, supernaturally diabolical happens. That's the devil doing it. It's not person casting yeah. the spell. You're not orchestrating the laws of nature to do this thing. Correct. That you want to exactly. Happen. So that's, that's a good. Point. And I've heard um, things like, "Oh, all this came to, all the seven books came to her through the power of the devil as she was on a train Are or you a bus." Me? No, it was delivered into her brain um, by the devil. And uh, it, it, uh, and I think Christians do a great disservice to themselves and to the Christian community by denouncing Harry Potter because of all of the Christian and Christ-like parallels in the books. It can be used for a great teaching to as a great teaching tool um, for Christianity, and Christians should embrace harry potter oh, well that's that's very profound of you to say and i i completely agree father i really do i when i was watching the whole series we were christmas break i was getting pumped up watching it i'm like that's jesus christ right there like these parallels mm-hmm. are striking like i you can't deny like this is a biblical story with wizardry and, and mm-hmm. magic kind of over top of it like it was it was really fantastic so i'm, I'm really glad you said that you mentioned the diocesan exorcist. Mm-hmm. Did he ever give you any opinions about his thoughts on Harry Potter or anything? Because he's the one that's actually dealing with 
the diabolical end of of things, diabolical issues mm-hmm. and exorcisms and stuff like that. I, I he's he's my dearest priest friend, and he has no problem with Harry Potter. You heard it here first, <laughs> folks. Uh, Exorcist here does not have a problem with Harry Potter, so neither should you. <laughs> but there, you do technically run a risk, I would say, of people developing a fascination with witchcraft and perhaps going into the real world religion of the Wicca and stuff like that. That stuff's problematic, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, dabbling in, in Ouija boards and trying to conjure up or trying to summon spirits and talk to the dead and and learn things that you cannot mm-hmm. know and gain powers you can, like that's that's very problematic but it can it can happen but it's not happening by way of the mediums or the soothsayers that board itself it's actually you allowing demonic presences into your home mm-hmm. into your self is is that correct and is this actually like you should be cautious when reading and and going about these types of things it's taking in entertainment that has to do with witchcraft. What do you think? It's interesting that you brought up, you know, palmistry and and soothsaying, thing, things like that, because the prophecy that made Voldemort go after Harry Potter was uttered by a woman named Sybil Trelawney, who becomes a professor And she does the fortune telling and stuff, but it's very clear in the books that she's a fraud, that she did utter that prophecy, but uh, Dumbledore doesn't believe in divination. Uh, McGonagall, Professor McGonagall, she makes it very clear she doesn't believe in divination. Um, And I don't think any of the other professors believe in that. The only reason they hired her is to protect her, because if anyone found out that she was the one that uttered the prophecy, she would be in grave danger. Oh. Um, so that's the only reason she's there. Um, but it's clear that all that, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, looking into a crystal ball and all that is is not real. Right, and you know they even that all the students see her as a fraud. Well, all there's a couple of girls that really like her, um, and are fascinated by her. But most of the students, and I would say all of the professors at the school, just think she's a big fraud. Right. I think in the real world, and, and a Catholic would say that too that that's right. just fraud. And I think in the real world, the the vast vast majority of people like that are frauds. If not mm-hmm. entirely, they are all frauds. They don't have any abilities within themselves. But mm-hmm. I think that they these types of activities, occult activities, could be gateways into developing some demonic um, obsession and fascination, and eventually, mm-hmm. you yourself asking demons to do some work for you and that's never Mm -hmm. a good thing so i i always advocate for people to stay away from inviting mediums into their home and trying to talk to uh deceased relatives and stuff like that because you never know some demons might just be waiting for you to ask that and all of a sudden you hear a voice in your ear it sounds like your your deceased mom or something like that and that impossible that's not the you, when when a person dies, they go to heaven, hell, or purgatory. They don't stick around your house. That's not your grandma that you think is haunting your house. Mm-hmm. You know that's demonic activity, right? If if it's anything metaphysical at all, if it's it's probably not even demonic activity. It's probably an old house making noises, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But if there are some things that you cannot write off as being natural occurrences, mm-hmm. then yeah, it's it's certainly not your grandma, right? There's Correct. no real reason to think that either. Correct. Yeah. yeah, we die, our bodies and souls are separated, we go to heaven, hell, or purgatory. We don't, the, sticking around your, your old family house isn't an option. How, I have heard though, Father, that some, I've heard some priests um, say that it's okay to theorize, and some priests theorize themselves that, you know, perhaps, as a form of purgatorial penance, God would allow you to try to get people to pray for you. And that some some hauntings like in a church or something that I've heard stories of during mass, daily mass, the candles would blow out every day, every mass at this certain time. And they were like, this is probably this, um, this uh, seminarian 
who recently died and he might be wanting us to pray for him. So they did like this 30 day, you know, pray, prayer thing for him and for his soul, I should say. And the stuff stopped. So what do you, what do you think about that? Is it impossible? There are, there are cases in the lives of the saints um, where a soul of a deceased uh, fellow nun or a monk or something has appeared um, to one or more of the other religious and asked, for prayers, they said, "I'm in purgatory, and I need more prayers, and I need more masses in order to get out of purgatory." So that does happen, hmm. but that's not what people mean when they say there's a haunting. What? They don't yeah. mean people appearing and saying, "You need to pray more for me because I'm still in purgatory." That's you know, hauntings is like, you know, ghost hunters, you know, asking you know for, uh, for spirits to speak to them and to make a noise and mm-hmm. which is all very 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 dangerous but to your original question you can read anything watch anything that you in your own mind can lead you to be interested in evil things i don't think there's anything specific in harry potter that's going to make you fascinated with what in real life we call witchcraft um, because that's not the nature of wizardry in her novels. I wouldn't read the books if I thought that that was the case. Because when I when I watched the movies years ago, when they were coming out in the theater, just because I enjoy um, movies, and I really liked them, and people were started talking about how evil Harry Potter was, and oh, it's evil, it's evil. And I thought, well, the movies don't seem very evil to me. It's just a bunch of kids in a school. They have this natural ability that other people don't have. They're just born, you know. I thought, well, maybe there's something in the books um, that is evil. Maybe the books are evil. Um, and then when I was challenged by a parishioner to read the books, I thought, well, there's nothing evil in here either. Right. <laughs> so not only that, but I found it, um, there were so many spiritually enlightening things um, in the books that the books became very special to me um, because of the parallels between the life of Christ and Harry Potter and you know our whole Christian experience. People have to remember it's it's fantasy literature. It's not real. It's fiction. Um, there aren't really these wizards out in the world. There really isn't a Hogwarts. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like some people, people wish people, there was. I yes, found myself. I'm I like, do. Boy, I wish I could have gone to that school. That's <laughs> awesome. Oh, you didn't? I did. Are you saying you went there? I did. Of course, I'm Slytherin. That's right. Yeah. Father, this conversation's been wonderful so far, but we're about to wrap the whole thing up. Okay. Is there anything you'd like to say before we do so? I would say in conclusion that people shouldn't be afraid to read Harry Potter. Most likely if they hear that it's evil, they're hearing from people who haven't read the novels, and so they're just taking their word for it. I would encourage them, if they want to, to pick up the first book and read it. Um, no one's forcing anybody to read Harry Potter, mm-hmm. it's, but it's 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 a special series to me um, because I love her style of writing, her consistency. Not only does it allow me to escape into this fantasy world of Hogwarts and Harry Potter's world, but also I can draw from it very powerful spiritual parallels to the life of Christ. And it, 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 it has helped me in my own faith, reading the books. So not only would I say it's not evil, it's actually helped me spiritually in meditating on some of the aspects of the story. Um, so if this helps anyone out there want to read the books, great. If you don't want to read the books, that's fine. Um, but thank you, Paul, for for having me on here. I I appreciate everything, and uh, thank you. Well, the pleasure is all mine. Father Archer, thank you so much for coming on. This conversation was very enlightening. I enjoyed it a lot, and just thank you so much. You're welcome.
and all great things must come to an end. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like and maybe even a share. And if you appreciate this show and want to help support it, you can donate to it using Venmo or PayPal at The Paul Garcia Show. If you want to support the show and gain access to exclusive bonus footage, well then you should become a patron at patreon.com forward slash Paul Garcia and you will find a whole host of never before seen footage and full length HD episodes. Thank you Iroquois Farmers State Bank, Fairberry Furniture, and PSF Legacy Jiu Jitsu for your continued support. As always, thank you so much for listening to The Paul Garcia Show. God bless and have a great week.